Love in law where you might not expect it. Um, don't know if that's loosely paraphrased from various song titles or not, uh, but uh, we have a very distinguished panel um, who's going to um, look at corporate law and intellectual property um, and see what, if anything, uh, love has to do with those subjects. It's actually not so foreign because one of our core concerns, in uh, corporate law at least, is with fiduciary duty, and it's not such a stretch uh, to think that fiduciary duty uh, could be uh, put somewhere on a scale with good faith and no duty and love, uh, you know, um, from one end to the other. Um, but uh, we, have a, we have a wonderful panel. First will be uh, Stephen Bainbridge, uh, who is the William D. Warren Distinguished Professor of Law at UCLA School of Law, written many, many books, uh, which are my go-to resources for corporate law at all times. Uh, and has, um, has, has, uh, is a blogger extraordinaire, uh, and his blog is my go-to source for uh, uh, almost everything except for our local blogger, Paul Caron. Uh, uh, on uh, uh, the far left, Lyman Johnson is a Robert O. Bentley Professor of Law at Washington and Lee School of Law and the Lejeune <laughs> Distinguished Chair in Law at University of St. Thomas. Um, and uh, he will be uh, uh, talking about uh, love and corporate theory on my right is uh, Thomas Berg, the James L. Oberstar Professor of Law and Public Policy at the University of St. Thomas School of Law. And uh, he will be uh, talking about um, love and intellectual property. So um, this will be a, uh, I'm very excited to see how our, uh, our panelists are able to connect love to the idea of corporate law and intellectual property. So with that, let's start with uh, Professor Bainbridge. Thank you. Um, I first met Lyman 20 odd years ago at a conference at Washington and Lee when we were both spry young fellows. Um, we were comparing notes and decided uh, now that we're no longer quite so spry, we're both going to sit uh, <laughs> and give our backs a break uh, in our talk. Uh, when I was invited to give this talk, the call for our conference uh, immediately brought to mind Benjamin Cardozo's opinion in Meinhardt versus Salmon, uh, in which Cardozo held that Salmon, uh, who was in a partnership with Meinhardt and was functioning as the managing partner, uh, had put himself in a position in which, quote, thought of self was to be renounced. And of course, there are obvious parallels between Cardozo's framing of partnership fiduciary duty in this way and formulations of agape familiar from the literature. This observation suggested several questions. Uh, first, did Cardozo intend the analogy? Uh, did he intend to invoke this notion of agape? Second, regardless of Cardozo's intent, uh, would agape be an appropriate standard for partners fiduciary obligation. Third, if not, and I suppose I'm flagging my answer to the second question, uh, third, if not, does agopic love have any relevance to the governance of partnerships? Now in Meinhardt, Cardozo cloaked the fiduciary principle in the sort of rhetorical finery that perhaps only he is capable of. He wrote, joint adventurers like co-partners owe to one another while the enterprise continues, the duty of the finest loyalty. Not honesty alone, but the punctilio of the honor of the most sensitive is the standard of behavior. Somewhat later in the opinion, Cardozo observed that Salmon was much more than a co-adventurer. He was a managing co-adventurer. In that capacity, Salmon owed Meinhardt an even higher duty than the one already articulated for ordinary partners. Quote, Salmon had put himself in a position in which thought of self was to be renounced, however hard the abnegation. Agape is often described in ways that strikingly resemble Cardozo's formulation. Agape, for example, is said to be, quote, the perfect love which seeks the good of the beloved beyond thought of self. It is, quote, a devotion that gives whatever is best for others 
without thought of self-gain. Agape thus is the willingness to let the self be destroyed rather than that the other cease to be. It is the commitment of the self by self-binding will to make the other great. All of which sounds remarkably like Cardozo's articulation of what's been called the punctilio principle, which has been described as requiring a loyalty that pricks one's own possible rationalizations of self-interest with the sharp point of selflessness. Did Cardozo intend the analogy? Did he intend to suggest that agopic love is the standard to which partners are held? Well, certainly it's possible. Jeffrey Miller uh, observes that Meinhardt is replete with religious imagery. Miller says, the image is one of religion, transcendence, and mysticism. The connotation is that when it comes to dealing with co-partners, a person must behave with monastic purity, always placing the other's interests above his own. It's certainly plausible that Cardozo had encountered uh, the concept of agape at some point. Uh, he had received sufficient religious training to be bar mitzvahed. Uh, his college studies had included uh, courses on philosophy. And we know in his judicial career, as uh, Judge Posner, for example, has noted, uh, that Cardozo's writings often contained a highly moralistic streak. And while it's interesting to speculate uh, about whether Cardozo actually intended the analogy, uh, ultimately it's bootless. We simply have no way of knowing for sure what his intent was. So let me turn then perhaps to a more pertinent question. Is agopic love a suitable legal standard? And I'm afraid not, even if one uh, sets aside such standard obligations as the inadmissibility of religious norms in making civil law for a secular society. First, agape is too indeterminate a standard. Uh, in discussing the problem that's inherent in a broad definition of fiduciary duty, under which the fiduciary is said to have, quote, a duty to act in the best interests of the beneficiary. Lionel Smith has observed that the indeterminacy of such a broad duty is such that any lawyer would agree that this cannot be the correct formulation. If we were to add to such a broad conception of fiduciary duty an agape-based obligation to renounce thought of self, the standard would become less rather than more determinate. Second, agopic love is perhaps too high of a standard. To see why, suppose we could put the question to Cardozo, do you really believe that the law can elevate the behavior of the market to some moral pinnacle? We might observe, as a learned economist has done, that, quote, we bourgeois are neither saints nor heroes. The age, of, the age is one of iron or aluminum or plastic, not pagan gold or Christian silver. Accordingly, as Michael Novak has observed, no realistic social order can assume heroic or even consistently virtuous behavior by its citizens. Everybody puts love of self ahead of love of neighbor, at least some of the time. As Martin Luther King recognized in a profound commentary, obligations such as agopic love thus are beyond the reach of the laws of society that concern inner attitudes, genuine person-to-person -person relations, and expressions of compassion which law books cannot mandate and jails cannot rectify. Such obligations are met by one's commitment to an inner law written on the heart. <clears throat> what then can law do? Dr. King famously extended his argument by observing that while the law cannot make people love their neighbors, it can stop them lynching each other. What law does is to provide a coercive backstop. Doubts about the prevalence of love in the population 
can be mitigated by a backstop of legal protection that enforces love. But this exposes the difficulty with Cardozo's rhetoric and the incongruity in it. Bringing to bear the state's monopoly on the use of coercive force on those who fail to love their neighbors is hardly the consistent. Indeed, I would put it to you that it is the very antithesis of agape. While the law, therefore, should not mandate agape, the law can point to it as an aspirational ideal. In other words, if we understand Cardozo's rhetoric as having a teaching function, we see that what he's really teaching is not law, but morality. Meinhardt is properly understood as an example of how courts influence best practice. This is a familiar concept to business lawyers. We frequently see courts seeking to influence not just minimal standards of law, but also to set aspirational standards of best practice. If that's what Cardozo was trying to do, what makes agape an appropriate aspirational ideal? An answer is to be found in the observation that those who engage each other in agapic love inevitably come to trust one another. This is so because agape promotes and preserves community. Agape is a willingness to go to any length to restore community. If one partner knows that his fellow partner will go to such lengths, trust inevitably follows. This is critical because trust has enormous instrumental value in business. Just as friction reduces the efficiency of a machine, agency and transaction costs reduce the efficiency of business activity. Trust lubricates business relationships and thus reduces transaction costs. Contracts are a useful but ultimately imperfect device for minimizing agency and other transaction costs. Accordingly, parties frequently rely on non-contractual social norms. Trust, as a social lubricant, is an especially important example of such a phenomenon. If I trust you to refrain from opportunistic behavior, I will not have to invest as many assets in ex-ante contracting and monitoring of your conduct. After all, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. If you prove trustworthy, moreover, I also will not need to incur ex post enforcement costs. Trust, thus, is not only honorable, it is socially useful. In turn, by promoting trust, <laughs> agape as an aspirational ideal therefore has considerable social value. Meinhard then should be understood not as setting forth a clear legal standard. As I mentioned to my students when I teach the class, suppose a client came to you ex ante and said, I wish to engage in this behavior vis-a-vis -vis my fellow partner. Can I do it? And your answer was, well, make sure you behave with the punctilio of an honor the most sensitive. The client is unlikely to find that a very satisfactory answer. My practice experience taught me that clients like yes or no answers. Cardozo, of course, rarely provided them. But if we understand that what Cardozo is trying to do is to get people to think about how they ought to relate each other, to telling a morality story that might in lead people to aspire to behaving properly towards each other. That, I think, Cardozo does very well. And that, I think, at the end of the day, is how we should understand the famous case of Meinhardt versus Salmon. Uh, thank you very much.
well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I like coming to Pepperdine. I was here a couple of years ago. You always seem to have such intriguing conferences. Uh, as it turns out, I was telling Stevens, uh, Stephen, I teach the Meinhardt case Monday. Um, it's always fun to teach that case. I think what I'm going to do is ask my students uh, whether Salman must love Meinhard and see how long I can go before I break the silence as they <laughs> try to figure out is he serious and as they look at each other's faces and are not finding any hints in each other's faces to that question. But it, it was a very good paper, Stephen. I enjoyed it. Now, I agree with Stephen that the law does not require uh, someone such as Salman to love a business cohort such as Meinhard. But I take up a different question, maybe the opposite question. Does the law prohibit someone from loving another? And specifically, does it do so in the corporate setting? If loving another is at least to be an option in law, if not an obligation, it must be possible. A person must be free to choose to love or not. If it's not possible, then it's really no great loss to say that the law does not mandate that Salman love Meinhardt. It wasn't possible anyway. My remarks are going to argue that corporate law itself does not prohibit loving action, although I think it can wrongly be understood as doing just that. And I contend that faulty views of corporateness stem from faulty modern theories of the corporation. Therefore, any prohibitions on love in the corporate setting, whatever love might look like, if they exist at all, must come from outside corporate law. Be that in the minds of some, the Affordable Care Act, or otherwise. Now, more specifically, I believe a business corporation may uniquely be an institution with a mixed purpose mission that combines the founding and operation of a commercial enterprise with religious beliefs. Thus, a business corporation can, it need not, but it can differ from organizations that are religious or charitable in their thrust, but it can also differ from those businesses that single-mindedly pursue only profits or shareholder wealth. I reject both as a doctrinal and theoretical matter the view that a corporation is one of only two types, purely religious or charitable or otherwise nonprofit on the one hand, or purely a money-making profit maximizer on the other hand. And I should point out that the term nonprofit is itself an utter misnomer. Frequently so-called nonprofit businesses do make profits. They simply cannot distribute them. What I argue for is what I think, in fact, is the case. I think we have a rich, pluralistic business ecology in which corporate founders and managers can position the company at any point along a continuum that runs from at one end, zealous profit maximizing. Think here of hedge funds and other investment pools. Two, at the opposite end, purely religious or charitable activities, but importantly, they can position the company at any point in between those points and pursue a mixed purpose mission. If there is discretion as to what a corporation's objectives can be, then love in the corporate setting is not limited to pursuing a money-making goal in a compassionate, other-regarding, and self-renouncing manner. It extends more basically to establishing the very goals and mission that will be pursued. In short, it opens up the end, as well as the means, to the influence of religious love. Now let me briefly address this as a doctrinal matter, which may be of more interest to law students than anybody else, I'll be brief, and then turn to what I think are the failings of modern corporate theory. Corporate law as a doctrinal matter is agnostic about the goals of corporate activity. Surprisingly to many, there is no statute that requires either profit maximization or shareholder wealth maximization. 
In fact, statutes in 30 states, including Pennsylvania, for Conestoga, where Conestoga <coughs> specialties is organized, expressly permit boards of directors to consider the interests of numerous stakeholders, not just shareholders. Pennsylvania actually defines a for-profit corporation as one having a purpose, not the purpose of profit, and the profit may involve pecuniary gain, not maximizing it, and in Pennsylvania, profit may be an incidental purpose, not the sole purpose, all of this under the corporate statute. Pretty clearly, Pennsylvania, like other states, does not require an exclusive focus on money making, but permits a for-profit corporation to pursue profits as one of its purposes. The recent enactment in about 20 states permitting so-called benefit corporations a new type of business corporation, means that these type of corporations can expressly combine profit making with other social purposes. This is their avowed purpose for being. Delaware, our leading corporate law state, in its new public benefit statute states that a public benefit may include having an effect of a religious nature. But I want to emphasize that these new benefit corporation statutes do not, in my view, and should not be construed to mean, in my view, that traditional four business corporations cannot also pursue mixed purposes. Now, moving beyond statutory law quickly to legal doctrine, uh, Stephen and I may disagree on this point. Um, to my way of seeing legal doctrine, no decision, with one exception, has ever forced a business to change its goals. I include in that the iconic Dodge versus Ford Motor Company and a decision from four years ago involving eBay. Those decisions certainly inc include language about shareholder wealth and shareholder primacy in today's term, but those courts did not force those businesses to alter their practices. Henry Ford was not forced to raise the price of automobiles. He was not forced to lower what he paid his employees. And Craigslist was not forced to change its social mission. The one exception is the Revlon case, which in 1986 did require managers of Delaware corporations when selling their business, but only in that setting, to maximize shareholder wealth. Now even those in corporate law who believe that profit maximizing or wealth maximizing is the default goal pretty generally agree that that background legal rule, if it is a background legal rule, can be altered by private agreement. That investors are free by agreement to say let's not have that be our goal. Thus corporate law itself being largely silent about mandating objectives it falls to those persons who organize and operate corporations to formulate and execute goals. Now these constituent features of corporateness, I emphasize, are the product of state law. The product of state law, not federal law. Now if law does not mandate a particular goal, then where do we get our beliefs about corporate goals? I think we get them from business lore. I think we get them from deeply embedded customs and practices, to be sure market pressures, and I think the way we teach this subject, and I think from faulty theories. So let me turn to corporate theory. In a recent article, my co-authors and I contrast two models of the corporation. One we call an association of individuals, the other we term a community of persons. Let me make just a few points about these models. These theories differ both in their assumptions about the humans within a company and about the corporate <coughs> institution itself. The association of individuals conception centers on the free-flowing individual as the essential moral unit. It emphasizes such matters as self-interest, preferences, choices, autonomy, individual utility maximization. 
Interactions with others are frequently seen as a series of negotiations with other self-seeking individuals. And this extends to interactions within the corporation, which itself is considered to be merely an aggregation or nexus of these bargained for exchanges. Little attention is given to virtue, character, or community, or to the kinds of qualities that precede or sustain or might be damaged by such exchanges, such as trust or loyalty. Now, the association model can be divided into two versions. <coughs> Shareholder-centric, that is, an association of shares, in which shareholder interests trump all others. Or a stakeholder-centric version, that is, an association of interests, which advocates consideration of additional constituencies. Although the stakeholder version may draw in more constituencies, such as employees and others, it is not really a rival theory. It simply broadens the groups of people who pursue self-advantage and whose interests must in some way be considered. But one still uses and is used by others in this view of corporate interactions. Now let me turn to the community of persons model. This model regards the key actors as persons, not just individuals. Persons having a spiritual and relational dimension, not simply an economic aspect. It emphasizes our human need to make a gift of ourselves <coughs> to others in service, as well as our admitted need to receive from others. It acknowledges the need for and value of relationship that extends beyond bargain and insists that the reality of self-sacrifice and self-renouncing, not just self-gain, must somehow be accounted for. At the firm level, the model emphasizes the larger institutional mission that transcends just an arithmetic adding up of individual interests. The model also notes that inescapably, all corporations pursue some moral vision, recognized or not. There is no moral free zone in business. To invoke a sports metaphor, just as 11 people playing soccer are engaged in a very different activity than 11 people playing American football, so too Pepperdine, Ford Motor Company, the New York Yankees, take your pick of organizations, are all meaningful ways of describing a more comprehensive institutional activity and common goal than just the various specific interests of students, faculty, staff, shareholders, players, managers, and fans, as the case may be. Whatever we want to call that, a real entity or an institution does not matter. However, I think some conceptual and linguistic way of preserving the critical difference between pursuing a larger, truly corporate interest and one or more individual interests should be maintained and acknowledged. Uh, thank you. It's good to be here. Um, I've begun working on how Christian thought might relate to intellectual property law, or IP. Uh, that area of law is uh, hotly debated these days. Uh, one reason is that the scope of U.S. patent and copyright laws, as well as the duration, for example, of copyright, have greatly expanded in the last generation. Um, a second arena of debate is international. Developed nations have used trade agreements to push developing nations to strengthen their IP laws because it's asserted this will attract innovation and investment. Uh, critics say that this harms people in the poorer nations, for example, by blocking affordable generic versions of patented AIDS and malaria drugs. So IP has come to be seen as a social justice issue. In these arenas, uh, arguments for maximal versus minimal protection of IP rights clash. Uh, property rights and information rest first on an instrumentalist 
argument, that they provide a necessary incentive to creation by preventing free riding that would undercut the creator's return on investment. Uh, there are broader econo economic arguments that emphasize that property rights facilitate uh, market exchanges that most efficiently commercialize inventions and creations. And there are Lockean type rights arguments that the creator is entitled to full reward for her talents and labor. On the minimal minimalist side, minimal IP rights, uh, one critique of broader IP rights is, in is instrumentalist itself. Uh, broad IP laws, it's asserted, Im actually impede innovation and creation by raising the cost to users engaging in downstream creation. But more broadly, many of the critics of IP rights offer a competing account of how creativity is motivated and disseminated. They appeal to virtues of sharing, and they invoke the concept often of the so-called gift economy in which valuables are not sold, as in a market uh, uh, economy or commodity uh, uh, arrangement, but rather given without an explicit agreement for immediate or future rewards, without an explicit agreement for immediate or future rewards. They point to examples where major knowledge has been generated and refined through sharing. One example is open source software, such as the Linux uh, operating system, free to all other persons to use and improve as long as they in turn allow free use of their improvements. And then there's Wikipedia, which has generated a staggering amount of content from dispersed, anonymous, and uncompensated con contributors. So critics say that the expansion of property control in, over information is not necessary and also encourages a kind of uh, uh, selfishness and attitude of control over information. Now, whatever you think of the general idea of a gift economy, in the uh, IP area, it is supported by a distinctive argument, and that is the non-rivalrous nature of information goods. If I give you my bicycle, I lose its use during the time that you have it. But I, I, if I give you an idea, we can use it simultaneously and indeed may derive greater value from the shared use than from the sum of our solitary uses. So why not share? There are two major difficulties with the gift economy, even as applied to information. First, don't there have to be some rewards to induce or at least support sharing? Rewards can be non-monetary or indirect. Uh, open source programmers reap uh, reputational uh, gains from their, from their work. Uh, so do academics, uh, who also receive salaries and grants. Wikipedia contributors receive none of these, but then writing Wikipedia context, content is relatively low cost. Uh, for contributions to knowledge that require much more investment, we may need more substantial uh, monetary rewards, uh, for which some property rights, it seems, are an important component, not a necessary component. A second problem is that gift giving may be effective only within distinct communities, such as traditional societies, academics in a discipline, or software programmers. Economists tell us that people may be unwilling to share freely outside a group of familiar repeat players. The ongoing relationship may be necessary to inspire greater sharing. It, it creates uh, reputational incentives that reduce free riding. Uh, indeed, even free software itself depends on copyright protection. Only that way can the creator of the open source software require users do far downstream to be compelled to distribute their own improvements for free. You need to use a license to do that that's backed up by copyright protection. Now, I've focused on the gift economy because in several ways it parallels the Christian notion of love. Peter Lightheart remarked uh, on, an in a, on this in an article in First Things uh, uh, recently. He said, uh, he was talking about the gift economy in Christianity. For Christians, he said, gift is a basic element of human life. 
He cites Martin Luther's large catechism, which sums up the entire history of creation and redemption under the rubric of gift. The Father gives at creation. The Son gives himself to reconcile us to the Father. The Spirit gives himself so that we can receive and retain the gift. Lightheart adds, uh, quote, since all is gift, Luther taught, we are bound to be grateful, to thank and praise, serve and obey. As this suggests, the sense of gift and gratitude uh, ties closely to our love of God and neighbor. We love because he first loved us, 1 John says. If God so loved us, I'm sorry, if God loved us so much, we ought also to love one another. Pope Benedict writes in Deus, uh, Deus Caritas Est uh, that this changes love from an externally imposed and indeed impossible commandment into a freely bestowed experience of love from within, which by its very nature must then be shared with others. Think of the two kinds of love in Anders Nygren's Agape and Eros, which I think has been mentioned several times here at the conference. And what motivates each of those kinds of love? If the motivation that we experience in Eros is desire for the beloved, the motivation in Agape, I think, can be summed up as joyful gratitude. So the first thing that Christian love might add to thinking about intellectual property and creation is an additional and kind of distinctive motivation to create and share. Intellectual creation may reflect eros, pursuing the beautiful or the true, but it is also agape, sharing a gift. But if gift and gratitude issue in love, this inspires one not simply to create, or it should inspire one not simply to create, which might be con still be consistent with restricting access solely to maximize profit. Love should also inspire the creator to share in ways such that all can benefit, or a wide range can benefit. In short, love has, I'm saying love has the potential to unite the motivation for creation together with an obligation to benefit others through the creation. Uh, Non-Christian and secular creators also describe uh, inspiration as emanating from an external source beyond that of the author herself. Lewis Hyde's influential book called The Gift quotes um, an environmentalist and beat poet, Gary Snyder, uh, uh, saying, quote, you get a good poem and you don't know where it came from. Did I say that? And so you feel humility and you feel gratitude. Hyde adds that the gift isn't fully realized until it is given away, the creative gift. And he quotes Meister Eckhart, the mystic, uh, that the true form of gratitude for a gift is to be fruitful in it. Pay it forward or pay it around. Uh, even our pluralistic secular society, I think, can understand the idea of expressing gratitude for an externally bestowed gift by making it available for others' benefit. A second feature of agape that may be relevant is its element of universality. In agape, each human being has irreducible worth and dignity regardless of his or her status or actions or desert. Now, no doubt agape is expressed distinctively in special immediate relationships which affect our particular obligations in a whole variety of contexts. contexts. But no one is so distant that we might not be called to give to him. Here's Pope Benedict again. The parable of the Good Samaritan, he says, remains as a standard which imposes universal love towards the needy whom we encounter by chance, whoever they may be. Agape entails at least potential moral obligations, <coughs> note I'm saying moral obligations so far, to those seemingly distant from us. It constrains and directs not just personal gift relationships, but also commodity transactions. Now, what does this mean for intellectual property law? That raises the driving question of this conference, whether love has any relation 
in general to civil law and justice. Uh, I'm not going to uh, add, I think, a lot to, to that discussion that hasn't been said by, by others. My own view, very briefly, influenced by theologians like Paul Ramsey and Reinhold Niebuhr and their reading of Augustine, is that justice is not the same as love, but neither is it divorced from it. Justice, among other things, implements the obligations of love under conditions of finitude and sin. I'd suggest that IP rights play a valuable, important role in making love operational. Sharing alone won't do it. But I also think that thinking about uh, love can call for at least for some qualifications on intellectual property rights. And let me just discuss a couple and I talk about others, other thoughts during the question and answer session. First, uh, sharing must occur, ought to occur, and IP rights must give way if necessary uh, in situations when basic human needs are at stake. For example, when people face death, serious harm from disease, starvation, or other threats. So I think the obligations of love were uh, plainly and, and are still implicated by the crisis over the affordability of uh, AIDS and malaria drugs when patents were for a time used to block far cheaper generic op options and the, the difference in price between uh, the available generic drugs and drugs under patent, what companies were charging were staggering differences. Uh, voluntary provision by drug companies is, is certainly preferable, and some might argue that it's, it's the only thing that's consistent with uh, agape. Since I see agape as informing justice, not equal with it, but informing it, uh, I don't think that voluntary uh, acts exhaust the relevance of agape to, uh, uh, to what, what, ought to hap what ought to happen in the legal system. But it is preferable. Uh, but poorer nations, I would argue, and we've talked about this, were quite uh, warranted when in the early 2000s they declared public health emergencies and resorted to law to address the drug, uh, the avail uh, uh, crisis concerning the availability of, uh, of drugs. Uh, they compelled licenses at reduced costs, imported generic drugs from India and elsewhere, and pushed the World Trade Organization to validate those steps. <coughs> Beyond the situation of basic needs, uh, I'd argue that IP law should aim to help empower people in need to become producers and creators themselves, participants in economic and cultural life. Agape desires the other person's freedom. Jean Outka, I believe it's pronounced, writes in a, a, a good uh, a book, clarif book length clarification of the concept of agape. He writes, it's of the essence of proper respect that we encourage others to be co-agents and, and accept and welcome them as such as cooperating with ourselves in a common enterprise. Uh, say more again in the questions about the goal of empowerment, it calls, I think, for using IP rights in certain ways to empower the needy, but also for preserving certain important limits on IP rights that have traditionally been there, such as fair use uh, in copyright particularly and various non-commercial uses. Uh, these limits are typically tailored under established doctrine to what are called productive or transformative uses of the protected work. You make, you, you add on to it, you build upon it, you transform it in some way. Uh, as a result, these kinds of exceptions are not really paternalistic, nor do they create dependency. Rather, they encourage and empower, operate primarily to encourage and empower further creation. Uh, IP maximalists have been trying to erode those limits in various ways, and that's a big part of the story about the debate over IP in the last uh, few years. But with, without such limits, I'd argue, IP will be, as it too often has been, a great immediate deal for the wealthy nations, but a bad one for the poor. And I think we can uh, critique that from the standpoint of love as well as justice. Thank you.
this point, uh, let's uh, open up for questions. I just sort of throw out for those who aren't corporate law enthusiasts or, um, or intellectual property enthusiasts, you know, sort of, I think Professor Bainbridge has the cleanest case for uh, an application of love because it's just Meinhard and Salmon, you know, and what Salmon takes, he takes away from Meinhard, and so it's easy to think of a duty that Salmon has when he's managing Meinhard's money because it's just self-interest between Meinhard and Salmon. I think Professor Johnson has a little bit of a harder uh, case, perhaps, because um, what you take away from one, you're, what you give to one, you're taking away from the other. So if you love uh, the environment or if you love the employee, you're taking from the shareholder and perhaps not loving them. I think you pre presented a compelling case, but there are trade-offs. And maybe you can't love everybody. <coughs> and in intellectual property, I think it's kind of the same thing. Um, if I love uh, the person by allowing the generic um, I, uh, uh, IP rights notwithstanding a uh, patent, um, perhaps I'm not loving the person who has a terminal disease right now, um, who a uh, drug will not be developed in time if there aren't sufficient incentives for that for, for, for companies to develop it. Um, but you are loving the person who has the terminal disease that is treatable right now and can't afford the, the treatment, right? So there are trade-offs, perhaps even more trade-offs in, in that context. So uh, with that, let's just open it up for, for questions or comments. Yeah, and I want to emphasize, uh, to pick up on your point, that <clears throat> all of this should be transparent. There should be no surprises about what a business is doing. And that there can be a pluralist approach, and, and that's important, that, that some might wish to love in a particular way or with particular objects of affection and love, and others, others. But your, you know, your, your question is a good one, and there are trade-offs. Uh, one that comes to mind from Minnesota um, is, I think it's Marvin Windows, but it, it, I may have the name wrong. You know, when we hit the crisis in 2008, it wasn't exactly good for the home building business. Um, so people weren't buying a lot of windows, and that's not good for production and factories and those who work there. And for a long time, um, the family said, um, we're going to try not to lay people off. We're, we're going to try to not increase profits by reducing costs. And when I read that, I thought, well, that's, that's, a, that's a very nice approach to take. That's, that's sort of very um, social entrepreneurial. And then I remembered uh, a fellow that I met about 20 years ago who said, yeah, my grandfather founded Lane Furniture Company. Very famous, you know, they make cedar chests. He said in the Depression, he didn't lay anybody off. He cut wages. He cut how much his family made. But I think one obvious uh, beneficiary is employees. And maybe you have uh, some other examples, but I... Um, that, that is an obvious one between the employees and the owners. But again, I emphasize the first point. No surprises for shareholders. They need to know going in transparently, this is what you're coming into when you invest. Yeah, I mean, I do because I tend, I, I'm a believer that um, shareholders have the suffrage. But once directors are elected, their responsibility is to the corporate enterprise as an enterprise. And they are to bring to bear their best judgment as to what that is. If ultimately the investors say in exercising suffrage, we don't want that, I respect too that that is their prerogative. But while in office, I think Delaware law would say pretty clearly 
you're not supposed to simply remit this question to shareholders. You are supposed to exercise your independent judgment on that. But you may pay the price at the ballot box. Well, is that really good for the business to simply give the assets away? No, I mean, that's not the purpose of the business. The purpose of the business presumably is to advance the enterprise understood as an enterprise and not as something that's going into an immediate liquidation. So they are fiduciaries for the company as a company with capital provided by the shareholders. It is not as if the shareholders are an irrelevant constituency. I would never say that. You're not going to have a business without capital. But in, in using the capital of the, share, of the shareholders, the directors do need to make their decisions about what is best for the business. And to me, your, your hypothetical would be easy. That's not advancing the enterprise. Happy to go, but Stephen, go ahead. Um, profit maximization defined how, right? Profit maximization defined as in squeezing the, the last penny out of every transaction so that you meet this quarter's numbers. Uh, profit maximization defined as uh, profits that will be sustainable over the long haul, um, uh, you know. Um, so we so profit talking about profit maximization um, in in the abstract is is difficult to um, uh, because you can mean many different things by profit maximization. But let's take just naked profit maximization. We're out to make as much money as we can. Um, if my shareholders are pension funds, charitable foundations, and the like, and I'm making a ton of money that I'm paying out to them as dividends, how is that not loving pensioners and charities? You know, I mean. Um, I don't think there's anything necessarily inconsistent with love and making a buck um, where the inconsistency between love and profit maximization comes into play is where you maximize profits by doing things that are unjust, that doing things where um, uh, you're harming others in the course of it uh, uh, and the like. Um, but I think the, the, the problem we get into, too, and, and if I could use your question as a, as a jumping off point just to engage Lyman for a minute. Um, one of the great difficulties, there, there's so many wonderful ideas in your paper that I, I wish I had time to engage with you, but one of the ones that I'll just mention is to follow up on some of the questions that have been asked. How would you deal with a case in your community model of uh, a case like Hobby Lobby? Whereas you know, one of the arguments that's being made in favor of the government's position in the Hobby Lobby case is that the shareholders of Hobby Lobby and Conestoga Wood are imposing their moral views on their employees and thus harming the employees by denying them a government benefit. And the, the difficulty that I've always had with communitarian models of corporations, particularly corporations uh, of any substantial size, and Hobby Lobby certainly, while it's closely held, is a pretty big business, is it's difficult for me to think of community as a, if we mean by community, a, a group of people with shared values 
when you have you know several thousand employees um, and some of whom are going to want birth control coverage and so on so how would you how would the communitarian understanding apply in that kind of a setting yeah no i mean that's a good question but in a community uh and, and this is true of, of a community of a business conceived as a community still has a decision making structure i mean i don't envision Hobby Lobby or Conestoga Wood Specialties as a partnership of 1,200 people. I mean, it could be. Uh, we certainly have very large general partnerships, but they have executive committees. They have management committees. They still have decision-making structures. So in my remarks, the way I conceive of this is it is up to the founders. I, I credit those who form the corporation and capitalize it and the managers to, to articulate and then to chart the business strategy. And so it is going to be, in these two cases, the views of those who control these businesses. It is their vision of what it means to love. And that may be at odds with the vision that some other employees have. Can, can I jump in on that just because I've been involved in Hobby Lobby too, but, but, but Steve, isn't, isn't your question to Lyman um, conflating a communitarian model of corporate law that, that regulates the corporation from a communitarian standpoint by the state, whereas isn't Lyman talking about a kind of a, sticking with the sort of the facilitative model of corporate law, but allowing the, the corporate corporation to choose to be communitarian? Isn't, isn't that a, a big difference between the two cases? And in fact, by, by arguing, the, the government, by arguing that corporations have no free exercise rights, it seems to me, is cutting, you know, sort of very strongly against the idea that corporations would develop sort of their own communitarian ideal of, of protect, of, that, that might involve protecting workers. And in that particular instance, the, the government claims it's, it's harming workers, and maybe it is. That's, that's a uh, separate question. But isn't there a difference between uh, the mandatory communitarian ideal and what Lyman's discussing? Oh, I think that I think that's I think that's certainly true. Um, although I think my question actually addressed at least implicitly both, and certainly Lyman's answer addressed uh, implicitly both, in the sense that you know one of the the difficulties one has with talking about communitarian models of the corporation is that the people who are espousing these models often seem to have in mind you know, sort of the New England town meeting understanding of community, whereas I think Lyman is articulating very correctly and, and very insightfully that you can have larger communities that are going to have leaders who sometimes are going to have to make tragic decisions yes. on behalf of the community as a whole, but the fact that they have to make those sort of decisions and the fact that there's a decision-making structure he would argue, if I'm perhaps putting words in his mouth, but he, I think, take it would argue, doesn't change the fact that you're still talking about a community. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. In other words, I believed in director primacy. <laughs> well, <laughs> his, his theory. <laughs> which Inside I, which joke. Which I avoided in my entire talk. Inside joke. We have uh, come to the end of the, uh, of the hour, so, uh, uh, but I'm sure you can probably squeeze a few more questions out of our panelists if we come down after the session. So would everyone please give a round of applause to Oh, maybe I'll... Oh, was it 3.30? We've got some more time. Oh, we got more time. We've been granted more time. You've been given more time, the gift of time. I only had one job Sorry about as a moderator. That was cool. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a lot more time. Excuse me for that. But I, I'm you sure can I'm still, come, still come and ask your question down front. <laughs> Anyways.
certainly Ryan is suggesting, though, it shouldn't be dismissed out of hand. And so that we can define the omission quite so, uh, quite so narrowly. That's quite distinct from sort of the uh, 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 backside question, so to speak, which is whatever the claims of middle of IT thinking is very economic, very commercial, uh, transactions and, uh, and incentives and all of that. Uh, and then there are sort of two critiques of it. One is the word, uh, which says that, uh, in fact, sharing itself can be created in the social value associated with, uh, uh, with a principle of law that, that is actually incorporated and modeled by but the other non-economic critique, which, which implies the types of it, is some intellectual property rights, uh, not just patents, but, but in the case of, uh, of, of copyright, for example, and, and it's a whole moral rights discourse, where the argument is that the initial creators of certain sorts of creative works should have rights that continue and which should not be alienated, uh, or at least should not be equally alienated. Uh, and those arguments dignitary conception of the relationship between the creator and the work. Uh, so yes, the original creator Superman might have pulled off uh, uh, the rights, but a, 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 a fuller, less economically uh, constipated idea of the relationship between the creator and the For the artist who might have continued to write, at least not during the work of story, even though she sells the work. So, what I wonder is uh, uh, are these simply two different critiques that have nothing to do with each other, or could they both, in some broader sense, uh, come under the more general umbrella of the topic that we just discussed? So, suggests either. Um, well, you know, I don't have a full definition of agape. You'd have to sort of de um, decide what exactly it means. Um, and then you'd have to evaluate moral rights, the kind of inalienable rights of the, uh, of the artists um, that are present in basically continental European IP law and not so much in the Anglo-American tradition. You have to decide what those, uh, whether those serve that ideal or reflect that ideal. Um, there's, there's certainly a, there's certainly a, a way in which moral rights um, dovetail with, I think, uh, theology, both Jewish and Christian, about the nature of the creative act and the the divine inspiration in it, the coming from somewhere else, if, if, you, if you know, the, that some artists uh, feel uh, 
And Bobby Qual at DePaul has written a lot about this and justified a uh, strong version of, of more rights in American law on that, that basis. Now, I think of agape as, um, as, connect, as going beyond that and then talking about the outflow to others of that, that love. And we can, we can equ not, not equate, but certainly analogize or see an overlap between creativity and love, right? God's act of creation is, is God's love. Um, uh, so uh, that's, that's, that's a kind of love, but I'm not sure that, that, you know, I'd have to see how moral rights then reflect or lead to an outflowing uh, or support the outflowing of that love to others. And it might be, you know, you're more willing to share your work with others if you know it can't be, uh, people can't do various things to it. Um, and, uh, you know, in our system, there might be sort of First Amendment arguments that somebody can do all sorts of nasty things to your, to your work that might not be uh, allowed in the French or German traditions, and that might, you know, so maybe more artistic works are encouraged that way. There are, I, I think, some, some tensions between our concepts, or what at least are dominant concepts of freedom of speech in the, uh, that uh, as applied to IP may conflict with some idea, with some elements of agape. Um, so I can see the connection, but it doesn't seem to me as direct as the kind of limits on IP for the benefit of others. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, you know, this the Peter Lighthart's article on this is in First Things is really interesting. He talks about the idea that you 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 have to give something back to the giver, not you know not at that moment, or else it would be a, a market or you know an exchange, but it's part of a relationship. Um, and he um, talks about the the positives of that, but also sort of the dark side of relationships where, you know, one person is identified as the giver and then you're, the other person is the recipient and then there's some kind of something owing and there may be power relationships in that. Agape, he argues, frees up that, that sort of tight relationship because the, the gift, all the gifts come from God. And so you're not obligated to give it back to the giver. You really are obligated to give it on to someone else because it's all coming from the same, the same God. Uh, and you know, I, th I think that's, uh, that's a, an important insight.
people who wrote those books did it because they thought the book was important. They made art, they did other things, uh, not for the copyright that would, would ensue, but for uh, a less a mercenary motive. And so again, the, the, the question, we need to look at, at corporate law and IP law, not only in terms of whether it's preserving love between the participants, but, but in terms of what it's doing to displace natural communities of love that previously dominated the scene uh, before the rise of these institutions. Um, go ahead. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think, I don't think all relationships are created equally. I mean, I think certainly family bonds are going to be always strong, one hopes. I think business bonds are not going to be like family bonds, but they can be very different. They can, they can be designed to look out for the interests of the other and not simply extract from that person. It's a different kind of relationship. I think what you're suggesting almost is if to to permit these different things that I think Adam Smith would call spheres of intimacy, you know, that there, that there are different kinds of relationships in the commercial sector than it, in the family, but that one doesn't necessarily adversely affect the other. Now, having said that, uh, Alan Wolf, a religious sort of sociologist of religion, wrote a book, I guess about 15 years ago, talking about the demise of loyalty in the American economy and pointed out something I didn't know, that the Girl Scouts actually dropped loyalty from their oath. I don't know if you knew that, but you no longer have to say that you're loyal. I think I had to say that as a Boy Scout. I don't know if they still say it. But, but he said that the corporation, because of how it behaves disloyalty, disloyally to so many stakeholders, has actually had that pernicious effect on other organs in society. So he directly makes that connection. I don't think it's a per se argument. I think it's more of a, this is the way corporations have treated customers, employees, and so on, disloyally, and, and in turn that seeps into the larger society. So that is someone that has made the sort of connection, but I don't know that there's a per se connection, if that's what your question is. Um, two thoughts, if I might. Um, the first of which is I, I would respectfully take issue with the historical account that you offer. Um, you know, uh, you can go back as far as the Code of Hammurabi, and there's a, uh, the code had provisions in it for something that looks a lot like a partnership and something that looks a lot like a limited partnership. Um, the law merchant. Uh, contemplated partnerships of various forms. Roman law had multiple types of business organizations. Uh, the medieval guilds come to mind. Uh, and, and so uh, in the United States from colonial times there were business corporations, although often quasi-governmental, uh, turnpikes, uh, mills and the like. Um, and so, you know, I, I think the history we can debate uh, I think that, secondly, to blame the corporation for these sort of activities. And the most depressed I've ever been in my life was when I worked for a partnership, right? When I was a lawyer practicing for a big law firm that was, uh, as Lyman said, a very large law firm that didn't just have an executive committee. It had uh, essentially a managing despot, right? Um, and. I talked to my students, you know, and my graduates, and, you know, many, most of them work for partnerships, and most of them feel pretty oppressed. Um, so I think it's incredibly unfair to blame the corporate form as a form for <laughs> disloyalty, oppression in the workplace, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think what matters are people, and oppressive people are going to oppress regardless of how they organize their business, right? Um, and, and I think to blame, you know, an off-the-rack set of rules by which people form a business for that sort of inhumanity towards your fellow man overlooks the fact that at the end of the day, these are legal fictions. 
right? To say a corporation does X is simply reification. <coughs> People do X, right? And, and I think you cannot blame legitimately the business form for the fact that some of the people who work in that business form are jerks. And I, and I agree with that, but I think that's why, why the way we have discourse about corporations does matter so much. What's the nature of the discourse? I think the, the you know the kind of abuses that are that are going to be are going to vary according to the institutional setup that we have, and so it might matter a lot um, which you know which system in, encourages uh, worse kind of abuses or or kinds of abuses that are particularly um, harmful at a particular period in time. I agree with Steve that pe bad people are going to do bad things under any any system, but it, just exactly what those bad things are may differ. Uh, there, there's a trade-off all the time, right? So I'd quarrel with you historically. Before copyright, uh, people uh, uh, wrote, you know, wrote for money. They just had to get it from the the local uh, prints. Uh, and you know, you read the biography of any artist or composer before uh, 1900, and uh, the relationship with their patrons was was you know was usually an unhappy one full of turmoil and angst uh, so um, there are always trade offs i think I mean, um, let me try this a little different then um Paul Griffin wrote that interesting book intellectual appetite where he argued against that Christians ought not to participate in intellectual property because it's fundamentally tied to will to dominate right and i think um, that will to dominate right which is in its very essence is, you know, for whatever you think about Paul's book, and uh, it's an interesting argument, but I think he points out rightly that there's a close association between these business entities, intellectual property, and the will to dominate. And that, in, in, in effect, that's really the problem, right? That they're wonderful tools, but no one can doubt how corporations and intellectual property have improved human life around the world. But there's this intrinsic danger that it's cultivating or going to be co-opted But there's certainly, you know, we are fallen creatures, <laughs> right? And, uh, and so what, how can we protect ourselves from these, these entities that are going to be co-opted that way, almost characteristic? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. Is Can I jump in with a, a vote on that? Sure. I have a very good friend uh, who's a science fiction writer. And um, he had his publisher on one of his books as an experiment uh, release the book in ebook form without any form of digital rights management so that it could be freely passed around electronically. The reason he did that experiment was to see if he could make more money with or without DRM on the book. And the astonishing thing was they actually made more money. Uh, they sold the, the book, but that book actually made more money uh, than the books that they had sold with DRM. And so moving forward, all of his ebooks are now being sold without digital rights management. But it's precisely so that he makes more money rather than less. Can you tell us the name? Yeah, his name's John Scalzi. It did seem counterintuitive, but um, their their theory basically was people. A lot of people got the ebook and um, uh, felt some either some moral obligation to pay. Or the ebook was simply not convenient, and they ended up buying it in hard copy or paperback. But it's pretty remarkable.
what you also what you want is to give away the book for music to people who wouldn't buy it anyway, and then make people start a project for people who should hear about the book. No, I mean, the dumbest thing I've ever seen about the corporation was that documentary that tried to say corporations are psychopaths. Um, you know, a corporation is a legal fiction representing a set of contracts between people, right? And there's nothing intrinsically about the corporate form versus the partnership versus the limited liability company um, versus the family, for that matter, that's going to encourage people uh, to uh, behave badly towards one another. Now, it is certainly the case, I believe, that largeness is often uh, conducive to your will to dominate and generally all sorts of non-agopic behaviors. And it is certainly the case that the corporation, the one attribute of the corporation that, that perhaps you could argue lends itself to this, is that the corporation's really good at getting paid, right? Because the corporation is much better suited than any other form of business organization to the needs of large enterprises. But that's not saying that it's the corporate form that leads to bad behavior, it's saying the corporate form permits you to get big enough to behave badly because the corporate form is also used by one person corporations that run Christian bookstores. Yeah, but it's like the difference between the field mouse wandering through the field and an elephant going through a forest. The elephant does a certain amount of damage simply by being very, very big <laughs> without even <laughs> intending to. Well, my thanks to these panelists, but uh, but to all of you who have come and to, to be with us this this weekend. We have uh, breakout panels uh, to begin in, uh, in in 15 minutes, but and so this will be the last time that we're together as a as a group. I did I did want to say just something about what at least I've got in mind for next year's conference. This isn't written in stone. I actually would appreciate emails if you have other 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 ideas or just ideas for, for future conferences that, uh, that we might do. 
But I see in some ways what I've got in mind as a follow-up conference to this one. By the way, someone suggested we need to have five more conferences on agape and law, and, and I think maybe, maybe we do, but maybe you could go back and have them at your institution. And <laughs> maybe we can, we can spawn a, a, a movement, which, uh, which, which I think would be, would be terrific. But um, the, the, the idea of agape and law, um, it seems to me part of, if, if, if you reach the conclusion that law should be influenced by agape and that lawyers should be influenced by, by agape, it seems to me the next question or a question not far down the line is what would be the loving thing to do in any situation? if you are going to look out for the, uh, for the good of, of the other. And um, whether, you're, whether you're a judge or whether you're a legislator or whether you're a lawyer, it seems to me that um, requires the exercise of practical wisdom. Um, and one, of the, one of the kind of bottom lines that, uh, that a lot of authors who write on love and law come to, they'll wrestle with justice and uh, um, justice and love, and come back to that one wonderful formula, uh, justice tempered with mercy, but that just leaves you with the question, when should you temper justice with mercy? And you've got all these factors that, uh, that, that I think should be taken into consideration. And um, the answer, I guess, is that in an individual situation, it's the exercise of practical wisdom. Um, many of you know the, the books that were written by Dean Anthony Cronman and uh, Mary Ann Glendon um, a few years ago um, about lawyers. And both of them, I mean, they took different tacks, both of them came to the conclusion that the central lawyer um, gift to the client, the central lawyer virtue, is practical wisdom, that a lawyer can step back from the circumstances uh, can understand the situation and figure out how to how to di direct things from there to achieve the multiple goals of the the client, uh, but also um, assess the goals of the uh, of the system and the society as a whole. So anyway, as you can see, there's a lot lot of thoughts there that are centered around the virtue of practical wisdom. So next year. Um, my, my thought is that we'll do a conference on wisdom, law, and lawyers. And um, mm -hmm. I'll, be, uh, I'll be open to, uh, call to proposals uh, tomorrow, if you'd like to say that. <laughs> That's a very wise idea. <laughs> a wise idea. Thank you. Uh, and Dana. <laughs> oh, we, uh, we've already done that twice <laughs> now. We can, do it three, we can do it another time as well. But actually, um, as everyone already knows, uh, the person behind this conference is really Dana, who's actually, who's actually middle name, I've already uh, toyed with her new last name, her middle name is Sophia, which points us to next year's conference <laughs> as well. But why don't we give, uh, give a big hand to Dana, who's kept us all <laughs> Give her, you can give her a hand, I'll give her a hug. <laughs> Thanks, well this is the last time I'll have most of you together. Uh, thank you so much for coming. It was a real pleasure to meet you all and, and get to talk with some of you. Uh, tonight, dinner, if you're coming, uh, there are shuttles that will be outside at the entrance um, right after the last session. They'll bring you back here to campus after dinner around eight um, if you'd like to drive, that's great. I will be printing out directions for you and giving them to you at the end of the next session. Uh, it's going to be at Christie's Restaurant, which is in Malibu, just north on PCH. On your left, you'll see it. Uh, but I'll make sure to get you the address if you're driving. Uh, is there anyone who will be using the shuttle for sure? A few. Okay. Excellent. Um, uh, okay. Are there any questions about that before? Yes. Can we get Bob a round of applause? Yeah. yeah.